welcome. I have some refreshments for you all. Water and chippies. I'm also live streaming right now, so if you don't want to be on the camera, let me know. Hello, hello, come on in. Oh. Right, so here is the amazing Paul Tremblay coming in. All right, all right. I know my disembodied voice right now, Paul. I wanted you to see the group. How's it going? It's good to Almost see. Almost there. Hey, how you doing? You hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we're just getting ready for a, a nor'easter, but otherwise we're okay. <laughs> yeah, it's raining like a mother, and snowing, and raining. So yeah, it's good for my cabeza head. But just let me show a serious part, like who's that disembodied voice? Hey, everybody, we are live streaming. So if you want to fix your camera or change your name, feel free. But these, are you a Maria Ortiz student? Yeah. Sweet. What class are you all taking? Literature. These are uh, Maria's literature students. One of my students say hi. I don't know if they can see you. So um, this is also post spring break. So we also got some amazing people. Kirsten is here. I see. Oh, Leonardo needs to be admitted. My bad. Okay. <laughs> hey, come on in. He's on Zoom. He's on Zoom. You all want some chips and water? We got some refreshments. Help yourselves. What's up, Leo? This is one of my English 102 students. Mm. Well, so the, the thing is, is like a lot of writers are busy. Like I really tried getting Gabino Iglesias here and I was going to pay for his plane ticket and his hotel and he mm. couldn't get it. And I'm like, what the? Like, really? Like, bring the dude with you. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that was not happening, Paul. It's so good to see you. You look good. You look like you're losing weight, brother. What's up with that? Oh, thanks. I've got, you know, the fancy light up here. Uh, so, you uh, know, it does well. It's Switch to these glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the Bethel it took. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to wait because we're running on Harold Washington time. Come on in. Oh, sure. We've got chips and water. Oh, thank you. The only thing I forgot to get is napkins. I think y'all will be all right. We'll use our pants. Yeah, I know. It tastes better with your fingers anyway. So, you know, hmm. like most things. Uh, good, good, good. Good group. Much better than last time. So last time Paul came in was a huge deal because I'm a big Paul Tremblay and I, I, I say I'm his <laughs> biggest fan. <laughs> I claim it. Uh, and there were like two people that happened to just walk by and see the poster and everybody else was on Zoom, you know, but it was also a little later. So I'm so glad y'all came in. And I yeah, know thanks I said, for coming. It's, also, it's after spring break too, so they're just not getting back into the groove. By the way, yeah. Paul got two weeks off. Mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> I wouldn't come back if I uh, yeah. Well, I'm at a high school, so we don't like my school. Well, in Boston area, the public schools do a week in February and a week in April. And I, I teach at a private school, so we, we can do whatever we want. So they do two weeks off in March instead, which is much better. It's nice having those two weeks off, but it does make it hard to go back after those two weeks. And you teach math. So how's that? Well, good. <laughs> it's going. Yeah, I'm yeah. struggling to the finish line with some of the classes, but it's it's fine. You teach math? He's a math professor, yes. In fact, I was in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the sound right. How's that? Is that okay? Is that, is that good? Right there? Yeah. We'll keep yeah. playing with it. A little loud. How's that? Is that it's good? Can you, guys, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. No, you're good. I, I think the volume okay. was messed with, you know, it's always hard to get these things correct. Um. Yeah, so we were we were goofing uh, this morning. I was advertising the event again because I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to be Wednesday after spring break. And so I was pitching it to a horror Facebook group and you got a you got a lot of fans there who can't be here, but they're gonna watch the stream later. And this woman was like, yeah. "I would read anything Paul writes. I would read a map <laughs> up to the calculus part." Da, 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 just like gushing and gushing. So I I, I screenshot and I sent it to him. I like, check this out. You you are loved. There's a lot of people that are freaking right now. So oh, I appreciate it. All right, so welcome. Thank you for coming. This is I believe the fourth event I've had this semester. I have two more coming up. One in about the middle of April called. Uh, Empire in Transition. I'm going to have Tango Eason Martin, the A San Francisco Poet Laureate, and uh, Misa Juarez. I was going to have Lucha Cherchu, but instead I'm going to have another international poet. She's going to come a little later. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, I know it seems like I do love horror, but this semester I brought a lot of horror writers. These are going to be poets, and I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, also, a lot of times I do book giveaways, but spring break kind of threw me. So what I'm going to do is just give away some Kindle books. So leave me your email, you know, um, so I, mean, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Probably just guess, guess the animal or guess the number, or maybe put a number from <laughs> one to ten. I'll pick the three. 
but uh, but yeah, so it's a huge pleasure and honor to have Paul Tremblay here. Um, he is twice Bram Stoker winner, which is a huge deal. Has won a lot of awards and just a phenomenal writer. In fact, we were just talking about a head full of ghosts, me and this other dude, um, just <laughs> saying how much we love your work. And so with, I mean, you'll get to know more about him, but we have the privilege and honor of having him write from his upcoming book, which is going to be released in June. It's called Horror Movie. And the description is so dope that I was like, definitely going to pre-order it, come <laughs> paycheck. So uh, he's going to read for about five minutes, and then we're going to get the opportunity to ask him questions. And he is also a teacher, which makes him even more rad, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but he's a wonderful human being. So I always say, think of this as your second home, Paul. It's such an honor and pleasure to have you here. So uh, let's give a huge round of applause to Paul. Oh, thank you. Um all right. So, okay, I am going to read. I wasn't sure if I was going to present something or read, but reading sounds easier to me. <laughs> um, oh, well, thanks. So, too, brother, let me give a screen sharing too. You said you wanted that. You can also share the screen. Yeah, I was only going to do that if I was going to, you know what? Uh, how long do we have? Like, can I you do like a, a fun, goofy five minute presentation Absolutely. of something? I promise it'll be fun. I think it'll you be fun. It. 30 minutes so uh, oh jesus oh, 30 minutes okay <laughs> hey it's gonna fly by bro just like last time yeah. like okay um I'll, I'll read after but uh so i have a little presentation because as we were talking of some people just joining uh i do teach high school math by day <laughs> uh actually jesus this is my 28th year at the school when i started teaching higher ed, brother, you were not alone. i started teaching when i was 14 i was very smart <laughs> i'm just kidding i wish um so like I don't do like I've I've only done like uh, teaching writing workshops like a few times. So I'm gonna do like this little piece that I'm actually quite proud of, uh, and I, I promise it's very short and hopefully not too boring. But sort of the point of the this little presentation I'm going to do, um, well, I, hopefully the point will be obvious at the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm gonna break down what I think is the best horror story ever written. I'm gonna break it down in its entirety. You're gonna be blown away. Some of you may have read it. Some of you may not have read it. Um, I will say sort of like the ultimate theme of it is like all stories need what's called lift. And I'm, I'm borrowing that term from, uh, John Gardner, who, uh, any writers out there, John Gardner has a writing book called the art of fiction. You know, at this point it's probably like 40 years old, but I think, I still think it's one of the best, uh, writing books on, on fiction. And, and for him, lift, it was always every story, whether or not it's a genre story or not needs like a sense of a strange, a sense of offness to help it take off. All right. So let's see if this works. I'm going to try sharing my screen. I actually think I have that book in my bookshelf. <laughs> uh, all right. And so I'm going to start the slideshow. Uh-oh. Uh, boom. Let's see if that started. It's slideshow in the top option. There you go. Play from start. It wasn't playing. There we go. Okay. Perfect. And I'll... Uh, I'll minimize that so people don't feel like they're staring at each other. Okay. So I know I've, I've talked it up, but like I am going to talk about my favorite horror oh my God, book. I messed up. I made a mistake. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, sure. sure. Okay. There we go. There. You're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're actually going to talk about this and you're going to get to experience this book in its entirety. The title of the book is The Monster at the End of This Book, starring Lovable <laughs> Furry Old Grover. <laughs> Now, listen, already with the cover, the story is already beginning, right? There's no author name. That's so weird. Uh, <laughs> it, we, we know the main character. It's lovable for old Grover. Grover even speaks to us. Boom. <laughs> and this is the title page. The title page, we get more character. We get humor. We get inquisitiveness. The fourth wall is already clearly broken. Like he's turning a physical page of the book. We are entering yeah. into metafiction. Uh, so these are pages, you know, two and three. Uh, the rest of these are two pages at a time. So right from this first page, we or this first set of pages, we get the what if, the plot of the book, the lift. You know, there's a monster at the end, and Grover is scared. So we are scared, but also a little excited. That's the thrill of horror, the thrill of transgression. Oh, I did. Okay, that worked. <laughs> um Let's see. So we, the readers, are introduced to the story. You know, Grover tells us if we don't turn any pages, you know, we're not going to find the monster. It, so we are a character mm. as well. <laughs> Grover's existential anguish and horror. We see it not only by the image, but by the font size. 
uh, let's see. So uh, on this page, we're getting even more of a desperate explanation as to why we should stop turning pages, a reminder that there's a monster at the end. Grover is now trying to stop us. So wait a minute. Are we the readers, the antagonist? Are mm -hmm. we the Renfield to the end of the book's Dracula? Hmm. More anguish, sorry for the blur, uh, more anguish and font. And we are, the readers, implicated again in the horror. What are we doing to poor, lovable, furry Grover? Maybe we are the monsters. Uh, so I love the I love the style here, I, Grover. <laughs> um, you know, we get a great little narrative voice, a taste of what Grover's voice sounds like, and it's a callback. Even just the I, Grover is a callback to all sorts of famous epistolary novels. Um, and he's, again, attempting to stop us. So the cracks of resignation are starting to show with poor Grover. Also, further implication of our own monstrousness by telling us what a terrible mess we're making. Uh, and again, more breaking of the fourth wall because so many of us feel shame for our messy rooms. I know. I <laughs> uh, so we have more continued causality and escalation. We might be reminded of the classic Grimm's fairy tale at this point of the three little pigs, right? With this brick wall. Right before it was, he, you know, he's building with wood or a stick wall. Before that were ropes. Eh, ropes are sort of like straw. Work with me. Um, okay. But again, he's daring us. He, now he's actually boldly daring us, trying a different psychological tactic. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> he, tells us we are, he's, he tells us we are strong. Is he, you know, sort of like coding for us that he's telling us that we can handle the story, that we can handle the monster at the end of the book? Oh boy, we're one last reminder. We have arrived at the climax. Grover is scared. We are scared, but we are also thrilled. Even if the last page isn't a mirror, we are definitely the monster. All right. <laughs> oh, no, it's Grover. Or is it? I mean, we're, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we're satisfied by the reveal, but if something lingers. Uh, we were told that this was the end, but there is actually one more page. <laughs> Grover is so embarrassed by... By what? His lack of knowledge? Is he embarrassed by our page turning? You know, without the text bubble, the Grover image is almost the scream, right? The painting of the scream, his existential dread and horror that there will always be monsters at the ends of every book. Mm. <laughs> so a little goofy, obviously, but like, I don't know. I think that book is a great way to think about like how to write not only a horror story, but sort of any story. I mean, the cool part is I think even as adults, we, we sort of just subconsciously get sort of the joy and even some of the thrill of that book without, you know, without having to dissect it like I did, which is obviously a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, I don't know. And the cool way to only like to describe that book is sort of, or especially as a kid, I think like if that's your favorite book, it's your favorite because of how it makes you feel. And like, when you think of that book, you remember how the book made you feel, not necessarily the sort of the same joke going over and over again. So I think that's how, all best stories work. All the best stories, you know, any kind of stories. I mean, the thing that they have in common is not only that they make you feel, but they make you want to feel. And I would say that, especially in the 21st century, where for so many of our, for so much of our time, like we're trying to disengage, right? Because we're just bombarded with the news, our phone, all this terrible stuff. And people even say, oh, I have to disconnect. I have to disengage. Um, and I think the magic of fiction is that it makes you want to engage, you know, and, you know, and that's a healthy thing. Um, you know, the last thing I would add about another thing that I'm really drawn to this to this book is sort of the use of, you know, the postmodern narrative or, you know, the use of metafiction in this case. You know, I think, you know, for the writers out there, some of the worst advice you could ever get would be for a teacher or a writing teacher or anyone to tell you that you can't put texts or blog posts or tweets or whatever you want into your story because it'll age your story. Um you know, the idea of deathless prose is, to me, it's a total canard. It's it's a worthless thought. <laughs> I mean, yeah. our, our job is to write stories for people who are going to read it now, right? right? I don't care about I don't care about the chuds. And I, when I say chuds, I mean the cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers from the <laughs> 1980s movie that we are, you know, what are, what chuds are going to be left in 50, 70 years from now are going to read our book. Uh, and that's not my worry. But honestly, if you do your job as a writer, um people from the future should be able to go back and read your book as long as you did your job. Like the, the quote unquote world building will be there. This is yeah. a book of this time. Um, you know, I don't do it for every book, but like so many of my books, I don't know, to me, that's sort of the fun, the narrative sort of like lift and, 
don't want to say tricks are sort of the fun part. Like I had a book called the Paul bears club and throughout the book, one of the characters actually writes, writes Right. notes in the margins and cross stuff out. Um, and even in horror movie and novel, which I'll, I'll just read from briefly, um, you know, there's the, there's the regular text, but at different points in the book, it switches over to screenplay sort of font. You know, the only thing is, is, you know, you have to make sure that those sort of extra textual approaches has to be in the book for a reason. It just can't be there for like a cheap trick. Um, anyway, sorry. So let me, uh, as, as your professor promised, I'm going to read just for five minutes from the the first chapter of horror movie, a novel, which is coming, uh, coming out July 11th. It I actually, love that as well. uh, it, ha it hasn't been announced yet, but, uh, I'm actually my publishers for the first time ever is sending me on like a U.S. book tour and I will be in Chicago. I think it's June Oh. 13th. Yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely post about that online, like when it's official, like when it happens. But yeah, it looks like I'm being sent to Chicago, which is very exciting. The first time ever? Uh, I was in Chicago one weekend No, in no, like no. 2000. I mean, the first time they're sending you on the national book tour? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, usually my tours are New England and I go to New York City, maybe Pennsylvania, but stuff that I drive to and stuff they don't pay for. <laughs> uh, with my newest book deal, we actually negotiated, hey, you have to send us on a five city book tour. Um, yeah, so it's, it's exciting. Although maybe by the end of it, I'll be exhausted and be like, why did I do that to myself? <laughs> no, I'm very excited to visit cities I've never been to, uh, including I don't count my going to Chicago one weekend in 2002 where I was just in the hotel the whole weekend. All right. So uh, chapter one, this is called Now the Producer. Each chapter sort of uh, oscillates between now and then. And it sort of gives you instructions. Anyway. Our little movie that couldn't had a crew size that has become fluid in the retelling, magically growing in the years since Valentina uploaded the screenplay and three still photos to various online message boards and three brief scenes to YouTube in 2008. Now that I live in Los Angeles, temporarily, please, I'm not a real monster. I can't tell you how many people tell me they know someone or are friends of a friend of a friend who was on set, our set. Like now. I'm having coffee with one of the producers of the horror movie remake, or is it a reboot? I'm not sure of the context or, or excuse me. I'm not sure of the correct term for what it is they will be doing. Is it a remake? If the original film shot more than 30 years ago, but it was never screened reboot is probably the proper term, but not with how it's applied around Hollywood producer guy's name is George. Maybe I'm pretending to forget his name and retribution for our first meeting six months ago, which was over zoom. While I was holed up in my small stuffy apartment, he was outdoors, traipsing around a green space. He apologized for the sunglasses and his bouncing sun-dappled phone image and that I can do whatever I want way and explained he just had to get outside, get his steps in because he'd been stuck in his office all morning and he would have been there all afternoon. Translation, I deign to speak to you. However, you're not important enough to interrupt a planned walk. A total power play. I was tempted to hang up on him or pretend my computer screen froze, but I didn't. Yeah, I'm talking tougher than I am. I couldn't afford to throw away any chance, as slim as it might be, to get the movie made. Within the winding course of our one-way discussion, in which I was nothing but flotsam in the current of his river, he said he'd been looking for horror projects as horror is hot. But because everything happening in the real world was so grim, he and the studios wanted horror that was, quote, uplifting and upbeat. His own raging waters were too loud for him to hear my derisive snort laugh or see my eye roll. I didn't think any, anything would ever come from that chat. In the past five years, I've had countless calls of studio executives and sycophantic producers who claim to be serious about, remood, about rebooting horror movie and wanting me on board in a variety of non-decision-making low-pay capacities, which equated to their hoping I wouldn't shit on them or their overtures publicly, as I and my character inexplicably have a small but vociferous or voracious fan base. After being subjected to their uh, after being subjected to their performative enthusiasm, elevator pitches, same movie but a horror comedy, same movie but with 20-somethings living in LA or San Francisco or Atlanta, same movie but with an alien, same movie but with time travel, same movie but with hope. And after being subjected to 
more promises to work together, I'd never hear from them again. But I did, I did hear back from this one producer guy. I asked my friend Sarah, an impossibly smart East Coast transplant screenwriter, what she knew about him and his company. She said he had shit taste, but he got movies made. Two for two. Today, producer guy George and I are in Culver City, comparing the size of our grandes while sitting at an outdoor metal wicker table, the table wobbly because of an uneven leg, which I anchor in place with the toe of one sneakered foot. Now that we're in person, face to face, we are on more equal ground if there is such thing as equality. He's tan, wide chested, wearing aviator sunglasses, a polo shirt, and comfortable shoes, and younger than I am by more than a decade. I'm dressed in my usual uniform, faded black jeans, a white t-shirt, and a world weariness that is both affect and age earned. He talks about the movie and character arcs and other empty buzzword story terms he gleaned from online listicles. Then we discuss what my role might be off screen, my upcoming meeting with the director, and other stuff that could have been handled in email or a phone or a Zoom call. But I had, insist I had insisted on the in-person. Not sure why, beyond the free coffee and to have something to do while I wait for uh, pre-production to start. Maybe I wanted to show George my teeth. As we're about to part ways, he says, hey, get this. I randomly found out that a friend of my cousin, a uh, close cousin, we'd spent two weeks of every summer on Lake Winnipesaukee together. Uh, anyway, this friend of hers worked on a horror movie with you. Isn't that wild? The absurd part is that I'm supposed to go along with his and everyone else's faked connection to in remembrance of a movie that has become fabled, become not real, when it was at one time decidedly quantitatively real. And then the kicker is, there's the social expectation that I will acknowledge our new shared bond. I get it. It's all make-believe, the business of make-believe, and it bleeds into the unreality of the entertainment ecosystem. Maybe it should be that way. Who am I to say otherwise? But I refuse to play along. That's my power play. I ask, oh yeah? What's their name? Hey. I insist people cough up the name of whoever was supposedly on set with me 30 years ago. I respect the person who at least gives one, putting their cards on the table so I can call their bluff. Unerringly, industry person X gets rattled and is affronted, but I dare ask for a name they cannot produce. The umbrella over our heads is faulty, imperfect. Uh, sorry, our, the umbrella over our head offers faulty, imperfect shade. Producer guy George's tan is suddenly less tan. He asks, my cousin's name? No, I'm patient. After all, with my ceremonial associate producer title, he and I are going to be co-workers. The name of your cousin's friend, the one who was on set with me. Oh, all right. Yeah, you know, she, she didn't tell me, and I forgot to ask. He waves his hands in the air. I forget I said anything, gesture. Her friend was probably uh, a grip or an extra, and you wouldn't remember I lean across the tabletop, lifting my foot away from the leg's clawed foot. The table quakes. George's empty coffee cup jumps, then falls onto its side. Circles an imaginary drain, leak, leaking drops of tepid brown liquid. He fumbles for the cup comically, but he's too ham-fisted for real comedy, which must always include pathos. He writes the cup, then leans in, sucked into the gravitational pull of my terrible smile, a smile that never made it on camera once upon a time. I say... Your cousin didn't know who was there, and let's not pretend otherwise. He blinks behind his sunglasses. Even though I can't see his eyes, I know that look. My power play is a form of mesmerism, calling out the liars as liars without having to use the word. I break the spell by asking him if I can borrow 10 bucks for parking because I don't have any cash on me, which may or may not be true. How to win friends and influence people, right? Listen, I'm a nice person. I am. I'm honest, polite giving when I can be commiserative and I'll give you the white t-shirt off my back if you need it. I can even tolerate being buried in bullshit. It comes with my messed up gig, but people lying about being on horror movies set gets to me. I'm sorry, but if you weren't there, you didn't earn the right to say you were. It's less narcissism on my part, though. I can't guarantee there's not a piece of that in there. Does a narcissist know if they are one and more <laughs> am I protecting the honor of everyone else's experience? Since I can't change anything that happened, that's all I can do. Our movie did not feature a crew of hundreds, never mind tens, as in multiple tens. There weren't many of us then, and yeah, there are a lot fewer of us still around now. I'll stop there. That's the first chapter. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for listening to my bladder. Oh, Inter yeah, Inter Grover. Read that because I had the honor of having read a Survivor song because I was teaching it. But damn, you know what people are saying about your book, and it's not just one circle. They're saying this is probably they're they're assuming it's going to be your best novel. I don't know why or who started this rumor, but it's out there, man. <laughs> you know, I'm like, and I'm like, lies. This is just one of many. <laughs> yeah. So let's open up for questions either about the presentation or this wonderful chapter that we just heard, which is enticing. Um, it, it, whether you're familiar with Paul Tremblay's work or not, I recommend all of his books, all of them. You, you know, amazing writer. And people who are on Zoom, feel free to unmute or pose a question in the chat. I'd be happy to speak it for you. Who wants to start? Yeah, and it could be anything. It doesn't have to be about that book in particular. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I, I have never read any of your books. But, so, I have a question about this book, what you've read. Yeah. Is, is it fiction or nonfiction? I mean, is there actually a movie? <laughs> uh, you know, it's totally fiction. Um, sort of the, 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 I guess the plot summary of the book is so this nameless character who just read to you, well, not I read to you, but like the character speaking first person, uh, he played a character in a movie that they're just calling a horror movie. Uh, and in 1993, a bunch of 20 somethings made a, or, or filmed, I should say, filmed a, a disturbing art house, low budget horror movie uh, in Rhode Island. And you know, because something happened toward the end of filming, the, the movie never made it to screen. And so now it's, you know, 30 years later, and, you know, this gentleman is in on sort of the attempted reboot of the original movie. So the story bounces back and forth between, you know, the present, him trying to get it made, the past. And within the book, I actually include the entire screenplay of that original movie. Oh. Um, so it's sort of a, I don't know, it, it's sort of a mix of like a really disturbing art house horror movie. Plus, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm glad I heard uh, He's laughing a little bit like, you know, I'm kind of hoping that there is definitely like a slice of like Hollywood satire. Um, that That's some of the nonfiction. I, uh, I will certainly say that a lot of the, the stuff that references Hollywood are things that I've experienced or I, you know, other writer friends that have experienced, you know, Hollywood just really trying to take advantage of, of novelists because yeah. we don't have a union. We're not. Unfortunately, you know, we can't join the WGA, which is the screenwriters union. They have a lot more protections than we do when it comes to dealing with producers and whatnot. So you our only revenge, our only revenge is to write about it in a novel. <laughs> you, should, you all should unionize, and I'm telling you, and I have had this very brief conversation, but I do believe now, especially with AIs and not just ChatGP, just you know AI produced books, there should be some kind of protection. There are books yeah. being put out now that readers don't know are drafted by AIs, and they're buying them. And so that really raises the question of copyright and writer's rights. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a major problem and it's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. Our it's just union, publishing is just so diffuse. I just don't know how like we would. I mean, someone smarter than me would have to be able to start up. I mean, because what you're talking about is we would have to deal not only with like publishers, but we'd have to deal with Amazon that will just throw up like AI books. Um, I mean, true, there's so true. many different levels. Yeah. And that, that's the not... thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, the thing about Am okay, I'll shut up because I'm gonna nerd out about yeah. because I also own an independent press. It's a charity press, and people are. I mean, Amazon has a monopoly in Kindle. It has a monopoly in a lot of things, and so even the wholesale distributors are really difficult to deal with. So I can't get my books into Barbara's Bookstore, which is close by, because they don't want to deal with Amazon. But dealing with Ingram is a nightmare. I hate to say, you know what I'm saying, and they'll buy books from Ingram. But I do yeah. think. I'm pro union. I mean, you know this, Paul. I'm pro union. I'm an activist. Oh, absolutely. I think all workers, and I stood with the not just the WGA, but um, the Actors Guild too that were on strike. You yep. know, so I think I think I think you're absolutely right that something needs to be done so writers aren't taken advantage at any level. You know, I support that. Okay, sorry, I'm proselytizing. Go ahead, Maria. That's okay. Well, yeah. I was going to say really briefly, just since you mentioned AI, sorry, just to interrupt. I was yeah, typing, so I was looking ahead. for, I was, I was looking for the website. I can't find it, but myself and a few other writers are, uh, I mean, there's a whole, a whole bunch of writers doing this, but myself, Christopher Golden, um, Sarah Silverman, uh, mm -hmm. and Richard Cadre, uh, we have a, a class action lawsuit against OpenAI and ChatGPT. That's sort of been the process. We actually have to meet with the judge in like mid mid-june so you know you know there are 
there are some of us trying to fight back, at least against the AI side of things. And that's when we should all light candles and pray and send happy vibes. I'm <laughs> doing it. I pray for you all the time, Paul. You should feel my energies, not just for you, but well, thank for you. all of us. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Because it's a struggle is real. Just a, in general, it's a hustle. You know. Go ahead, Maria. Thank you. Um, so first, I just want to thank you for reminding me of a very scary book from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, as soon as I saw that, I was taken back, um, and I love <laughs> you talking me through it because. Obviously, as like whatever eight year old, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and now, right. as an adult and a teacher of English myself, um, I see all these literary references that were lost on a child. But um, it reminded me, like, even after I knew the end of that story as a kid, I was always still a little scared when mm, I read it. I yeah. guess that's kind of a job of building that tension. So, thank you for that. That was very fun. Um, my question <laughs> is about kind of. Um, non-traditional text on the page so my literature class right now we're actually reading poetry and we were talking just in the first half of our class before this about how you know a poem and you see it kind of right whereas mm -hmm. most texts you know i think i couldn't tell you this is fiction or non-fiction or history yeah. until i'm reading it right but when we see a poem because of its format on the page we know it so i i was sort of drawn to your um the, the some of the text you showed us that have like the annotations or the um you know engagement with like a digital interface or something so can you just talk a little bit about um kind of your intention behind or the effect you're going for with using that non-traditional text in your writing yeah i think <clears throat> yeah i mean because i've done it like so often it's kind of hard to lump it all into one umbrella but i can a little bit um Typically when I'm writing horror, I mean, I, I've written other stuff besides horror, but like my, my I want to say my default, I should say my default, what I'm obsessed with is a better way of putting it. Um, I try to tell these stories and what I think is the most realistic way possible, not in terms of like the literary form of realism, but to make it feel like, oh, this not only could this really happen, or maybe this is what it would feel like if this were to happen. So what ends up, so what ends up happening with, you know, the book that sort of broke me open, um, uh, a head full of ghosts in the in the book that was made into a movie, The Cabin at the End of the World. Both of those novels uh, really employ ambiguity in regard to the supernatural element. Um, like, and these aren't spoilers for the books. I never tell you if something is supernatural happening or not. Um, you know, A Head Full of Ghosts is a riff on a possession story, and The Cabin at the End of the World is a question of whether or not the world is, is ending. Um, and I think... For me, the, the role of ambiguity for both those books, I wanted the ambiguity to be the reason why those books were scary or disturbing. The idea that we just don't know. Um, but in, for those forms of ambiguity, instead of withholding information, uh, I tried to do it the 21st century way, whereas like you are bombarded with every possible piece of information. And because of the data glut, like you have enough evidence to build whatever sort of case you want to build, but you can't. You can't build one case over the other one. Uh, the idea that you just don't, you just don't know. So there's like, if I use ambiguity, there's that part of it. So oftentimes to help with that ambiguous sort of notion, I'll include like in a head full of ghosts, I, there's a blogger who comes in almost like a Greek chorus and mm -hmm. you're reading her blog posts and it looks like blog posts, the, the way it's sort of type written out. Um, and the blog post makes it harder to know what's real or not, because within the blog post, she said, Hey, the thing you just saw, that looks like this movie or this book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to me, that sort of served like two different things. Like, yeah, of course, <laughs> if a, a family hired a reality TV crew to perform a, uh, an exorcism, people would discuss this online, you know, and they would discuss it for years and years and you would have these people, you know, um, you know, talking about it that way. So for me, even if it, it seems like a, like a weird outlandish thing, like or, or an unusual thing to like open up a, a novel and then you see notes in the margins, you know, there's that moment of, oh, that's different. Like, why is that there? Uh, but at the same time, to me, that felt like a realistic thing because the book that had notes in the margins, this this one here, it's a it's a found memoir. Like someone wrote a memoir. They're not around anymore. And who? So for me, it was like a logic thing. Who found the memoir? Well, his best friend slash frenemy. And I knew she wouldn't be able to resist saying, no, this isn't true. Uh, or yeah, you know, I remember it this way and like, and actually putting it into the story. So, you know, there, there are times I could, sorry if I'm rambling. Uh, no, no. Sometimes like the, the narrative sort of technique is sort of the, the start of a story for me, but 
again, the, the trick is it has to be there for a reason. It just can't be a, it just can't be like a bell or a whistle. So my, my favorite example is, <laughs> geez, back in 2016, we adopted a, 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 an older dog. She was between like five and seven. Um, and my kids were older, you know, in high school. So people weren't home all the time. It's like, oh, I guess we should get a dog walker a couple of days a week. And the dog walkers would leave notes like like it was like a day, like a daycare almost like, hey, I was so happy. It was great. You know, she enjoyed walking, loved belly rubs and like pee check or poo checked. And I just thought those notes were so wild. I started trying to leave fake notes for my family, uh, but they knew it was me right away. But it, in my house, like I have to write a story that's told only through dog notes. And at first I was like, oh, that's a great idea. But then I was like, oh, what story necessitates being told that way? It took me two years to figure out a way to do it that 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 made sense, um, or at least made enough sense to me. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I'm just sort of drawn to those different things. I mean, it's probably just being like so many of us, just a child of pop culture. Like, I mean, I came to reading later than most writers. Like for me, like I grew up in the '80s and just watched cable TV all the time and movies, and I, I didn't become like a reader for pleasure until my early 20s. So. There's all that visual media that sort of introduced me to story. Uh, and now I, I kind of feel like I try to maybe apply, you know, some of those, you know, how they, you know, how they made me feel, how those worked a little bit into books somehow, but I don't know. I yeah. hope I answered a question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Fascinating. It, oh my gosh. Paul, Paul. Oh my gosh. I'm okay. I'm going to start gushing. Woo! That was brilliant and beautiful. And I actually, thank you love your style of ambiguity i loved it in disappearance at devil's rock um and which included police reports beautifully done mm -hmm. and in uh in the head full of ghosts i really enjoyed the blocks i loved the the i don't know it's just something fascinating about it. it's very meta you know like you were talking about postmodern literature and if you ever get a chance to grab the copy of the beast you are it's a collection of short stories that he put out there is this brilliant short story where this little girl um, she she pays for ghost tours, or they pay her to take the you know mm. the ghost tour. And there's this incredibly frightening thing. It's scary. The picture was scarier to me than the story. Um, <laughs> but tell them where you grabbed that from, because that to me was like, what? I'm always looking for pictures that my kids draw every now and then because they're so horrifying, you know, as a point of yeah. inspiration. But that was just dope, you know. And the stuff academic, just beautiful. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that, that was like a fun story because. You know, you never know where you get ideas from. And I, I don't know, I, I steal from like <laughs> my life and family all the time. And they're always like, they're always characters. But when my daughter was young, she went through the, like sort of the fun uh, kid phase. Cause you know, we live in the suburbs so our, our road isn't super busy, but she went through the phase like, Oh, I want to sell lemonade out, you know, out of the, at the end of the driveway with another friend. And then she kept like doing it. And it got to the point. It's like, man, like what, <laughs> you know, I always think like what kind of weirdo would show up which is, I think is the easy way to do it. But then like, I just had this weird image. It's like, well, what if she started selling other stuff <laughs> at the end of the driveway? <laughs> so this, the story ended up being like the first day these, you know, the, these two girls were selling lemonade and they're like, ah, oh, this is boring. The next day they decided to sell haunted house tours of their own house. And, uh -huh. you know, and they would set up like a fake haunted house. Um, and one of the ghost stories that gets told involves like something that this other character saw in a dream. And, and I, I took that image from my daughter, Emma. She drew it when she was 12 and she was having terrible dreams. She's like, Oh yeah, I have this dream. Like almost every night I see this thing and then I die. And as a parent, I was like, Oh my God, that's horrible. But as the horror, I was like, can I use that picture? <laughs> uh, and she let me use it. So, yeah. That's amazing. Go, go ahead. Um, yeah. I, while you were discussing um, the ambiguity of, of your, your books, um, I realize or I, uh, I'm, I'm halfway through um, Cabin at the End of the World right now, and so I don't know what's happening exactly. Uh, <laughs> your your notes on ambiguity were interesting. I, I've heard about um, when fantasy writers use magic system, there's like the difference between hard and soft. Mm. Where, like you've got uh, like a hard system kind of like Harry Potter where like you say a word and a thing happens and like soft magic systems with like Lord of the Rings where like you kind of lift your hands and stuff happens. Sure. You There's like a very mechanical system versus this kind of unknown power. But the difference between those two is kind of where the reader knows how magic works and the other one is just the author knows but they don't tell the reader but they still have to have an understanding of what's happening. 
when you're writing ambiguity, do you have an idea of what you want going on, or are you kind of just playing with it and seeing what happens? Oh, great question. But, yeah, that is a great question. Uh, it, it sort of depends on the story, but I would say, you know, first, with, actually, with the head full of ghosts in the cabinet at the end of the world, um, I, well, let me back up a little bit. So with the head full of ghosts, my initial idea was like, oh, I'm going to write like a skeptical, secular possession story, because no one has done that. I mean, in a while, in book form, like, you know, we have tons of movies. But when I got into it, I was like, no, this has to be, I have to keep it ambiguous. I can't like lean one way or the other. So once I did that, I purposefully tried as much as I could divorce myself from thinking there's a true answer or there's not a true answer. And just really almost imagine like that book. And, and, and similarly with Cabin, like I imagine it's like the scale of justice, except it was like the scale of is something supernatural happening or not? Like I wanted people to be able to be like, Hey, there's something supernatural happening. Here's the evidence. And someone else to be perfectly equally reasonable. Be like, Nope, there's something not supernatural happening. Here's the evidence. So for both of those books, I, when I wrote them, I did not have like an idea of, Oh yeah, this is the correct way. Um, or this is the correct answer. Uh, Cause again, to me, I think what I wanted both books to feel you know, scare. It's hard to. I have no idea of something scary. I just want something to linger with people, or or to be disturbing. I think those are things I'm more in control of. Mm -hmm. But you know, the idea that you just don't know for sure to me is just such a. You know, when you really think about it, to me that's like the most unsettling, unsettling part of our day to day existence. Like even like our memory, our identities are so dependent upon what other people tell us. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and living in the age of misinformation, like it's, you know, it's just, it's so hard to know. And I think in a horror story, anytime you use ambiguity, I think you're also subconsciously sort of picking at the ultimate sort of ambiguous question that awaits us all at the end, not to get too bummery or deep, but like, you know, what happens when we die? Like we, we have beliefs, but we don't really know, you know, and most horror stories are going to brush up against death in some form. So even though the story isn't necessarily about like what happens when we die, but if, I'm messing around with like basically, hey, reader, you really don't know for sure what's happening. I think that really sort of gets at that. You know, and some readers dig it and some really don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I, 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 man, my goal is to read all of Paul's books by the summer. That's the goal. Wow. It hasn't happened yet because I teach <laughs> the time, but mm -hmm. especially because I'm rereading some of his stuff. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, I have a question for you. Um, do you have like a routine? before writing like a ritual do you need coffee do you need a darker room in order to produce what's your yeah so um you know so i like i i can't remember why i mentioned it but you know i've been teaching high school like i didn't start writing until like i started teaching which is sort of like a weird thing so you know for most of my adult life uh or almost all of my adult like i've been a, a high school teacher I have, I did take one year sabbatical, not this year, but the year before. So writing and teaching has always been intertwined, which meant to me that finding time to write, especially during the school year was, I was just always on the hunt for time. Uh, so it became like a time management thing. So I felt like I couldn't afford any writing rituals. It was just like, Hey, I've got this unexpected free period. I'm going to sit and write. Uh, or I would even be like, Hey, these kids are taking a quiz. I'm working on a story. They could have been cheating our asses <laughs> off. I had no idea. So I I kind of miss that ability because I feel like I've lost it a little bit. I, so I'm talking about like the two early 2000s when I was first getting serious into writing. Like I wrote a big chunk of my book, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, I, when uh, my son was going to baseball clinics. They weren't games. It was just like boring practices, you know, games I would watch. <laughs> but like it was too far away to drop them off and go home. So for those two hours, I would sit there with headphones in my laptop and I wrote chunks of the book you know it's hard to do at first but like if you do it enough like you're able to sort of fall into that that hole into that space um i do find it a little bit harder now just because you know how much time social media takes up <laughs> for for everybody but like as a writer you're kind of almost like forced to be on there um so yeah uh i mean when I have my year off though like it was it was sort of nice to more fall into a routine like so i would get up in the morning have you know, breakfast, make a, you know, a giant cup of tea, you know, and the right for, that was my preferred sort of time was to do it in the morning. But well, now that I'm, you know, teaching and I, I have to write more at night. Um, so I know, like I, I encourage writers when they can to, I mean, 
do whatever works for you. Like if you find something that works great. Uh, for me, it's always about like you train yourself into making things work. Like it took me a little while to be able to write to, to write some music, but sometimes I needed music just to block out the stuff that's happening. Cause that, I don't know if you can see, I don't have doors to my writing area. Those are curtains. So the rest of the house is like loud, you know? Um, you know, same thing if I was not working at school, I wouldn't put my headphones in, but when I was at the, at the, uh, you know, the baseball thing, but it's funny, like what sometimes you inadvertently do. So then it became like, Oh, now I feel like I kind of need music to help me sort of like drop into the space. Um, but which is fine. Uh, yeah. So I, don't know, I hope that was, that was okay. Yeah, I, hope I, answered the question. Yeah. I told my students that I teach creative writing, do what works for you, where we have the best creative energy. Like for me, it's like three to six in the morning when the kids are asleep. Like that. Because otherwise I'm not going to get anything done. Right. But then yeah. um, I also, I just gave a workshop, not to brag. I just did a gig for a group of writers from Florida. <laughs> Because social media is meant to be addictive. It is meant to absorb your time. Yeah. And so what I advise, especially young writers, limit yourself to three, the best social media where you're selling the most. It may not be where you think it's going to be. For me, it's Facebook, believe it or not. Right. Um, but also to to limit that because you're going to get sucked in and and uh, just give it I, I give it maybe an hour in the morning and that's it. I do my my blogging, whatever I got to do. And then the rest is writing and then it's work and then it's family and maybe watching something. I do watch stuff you know, because it's good for my brain. But you got to find what works for you. Some writers, like Sarah Menifee, who's a big-time poet on the on the West Coast, she doesn't she doesn't have a schedule. She writes whenever she feels like it. She'll mm -hmm. go to a coffee shop and she produces, you know? So it really depends on you. And every project I find is also different. Like, working on a novel for me is very different than working on a short story. I can work on a short story anywhere. Mm -hmm. Just about, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And so it really it really depends. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, it depends on your rhythm. It depends on the time of the year, too, sometimes. You know, so you kind of got to play with it and reflect on what works for you, too. I think we don't spend enough time reflecting on things. You know what I'm saying? What What is your process? Your, your process is going to be different than my process is going to be different than Paul's process is going to be different than that gentleman with the blue hoodie over there. It's going to be different. You know what I mean? You just got to find your own rhythm, you know? Um, I don't know. Does that make sense? Kinda? Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? How about people in the chat? You all have questions. You can unmind. You can ask your question. Don't be shy. No? All right. Go ahead, Mijo. Uh, I guess I'm just a little curious um, what your, what made you want to write a book that deals, that takes place within the world of like the entertainment industry? Because I've always found that super interesting. So I'm just wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that, how you draw inspiration for characters. Yeah. Thank you. Um. It's funny, like, you know, some, sometimes like, you know, I've been very fortunate enough to actually like have book deals and sometimes like books sort of like assigned to me, like, Hey, you have a book due in a year and you haven't started yet. What are you going to do? So sometimes I have to go hunting for them well, with the book that I read from horror movie. That was like a fun sort of discovery that I fell into a rabbit hole that sort of became the book. So in, in the case of that book, um, I, uh, one of my writer friends who's a genius writer, if you've never read him, Stephen Graham Jones is an amazing writer, uh, super prolific. Um, he had mentioned like, hey, you know, my my friend Walter 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 Chow is a, this really great film critic. And like during the pandemic, he was doing uh, he was hosting virtual movie matinees for the Denver Public Library. So they would show like and during when, when people are in lockdown, you could watch the movie on your screen and then he would have a zoom discussion with like a really cool person. Um, but he had mentioned like, Oh, you should watch some of these. And uh, the first one I watched, Walter was talking about the Texas chainsaw massacre with John Darnielle, uh, who, who himself is a really excellent writer. He, uh, and he's also a, a fairly popular musician as well on the band mountain goats. Anyway. So I was watching these two really smart people talking about the Texas chainsaw massacre, which, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, uh, I just turned like 52 this year or the well, last time I had a birthday. I didn't watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre until my like mid to late thirties, just cause I was so scared of it. Like I'm not really much of like a gore violence person, um, but it's a brilliant movie and it's actually almost bloodless, which is weird. Like the original, not any of the remakes. Um, I do highly recommend the movie. And I do not recommend any of the sequels or remakes after them, but anyway, so they're talking about the movie and I was like, Oh wow. And Walter held up, a book when he was talking, it was called uh, Chainsaw Confidential. And it was, uh, 
you know, nonfiction written by Gunnar Hansen, the actor who played Leatherface, the original Leatherface. And at the time, like it was, it was out of print, but it was on Audible for cheap. So I listened to it and Gunnar wrote it and he, he narrated it. It was really cool. Like he, very good writer. Like he was, I didn't, had no idea he was a poet before he started acting as, as Leatherface. Um, and then he was talking about the movie and there were some scenes where, I mean, this was filmed in the early seventies where there wasn't any sort of, you know, full independent movie where there was certainly no care for the safety of, of, of anyone on set. So there were a couple of times it was like, well, they're really lucky the chainsaw didn't slip and get somebody. Yeah. And so like the, the first thing was like, Oh, what would happen? You know, I started thinking what would happen if the chainsaw had slipped. Um, so that, that became what that ends up being a horror movie. Um, so, I mean, the, the movie that's in the book is not Texas Chainsaw, but it's certainly inspired by sort of uh, the movie part was inspired by that part of it. And all the Hollywood stuff was just me sort of using like my, like, like I said, my anecdotal experience and other writers experiences as well. Like in that opening chapter, uh, having a producer talk to me while he was outside walking around, that was totally something that <laughs> uh, I went through. And I was just like in my head laughing the whole time. It was like, <laughs> what? Like, can you imagine? Like, I'm going to do a Zoom with you, like this really important meeting, but I'm going to do it while I'm walking around outside. I mean, you might do that with a friend, but would you do that with like a perspective, as much as I hate the word, in regard to art, like business partner? I don't know. Hollywood's a weird place, man. <laughs> you know, I got to say that I, I did, I was a big movie TV watcher and I read a lot. I think we're the same age, though. Maybe I'm older. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's just a number, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> But the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has such a profound impact on me that whenever we drive through Texas, I get scared. <laughs> Seriously, because you just never know. And yeah. so it was one of the first times that I encountered cannibalism by a family that well wasn't really that ordinary, but it's it's a frightening concept. There's also a lot of open space in Texas and mm -hmm. Arizona, too, where I'm from, so you just never know. You know what I'm saying? And it's that what if, right? And now, now we've had, like, serial killers and you know whatever but still still man every time you go up through texas i'm so glad we leave and go into new mexico <laughs> but it's a really good movie go ahead um yeah i have a question about your writing process or like your editing process I suppose. Mm -hmm. um my professor uh for my 247 class right now um for our first drafts she doesn't go you know tear apart super hard because you know there's, there's hardly anything there but to like ask questions about like your theme like so what is this writing about what do you want the readers to feel is that something you ask yourself to like keep your writing in check when you're writing or is it you just kind of put stuff out and then you like hand it off to your editor or like like is it are you self-editing as you're going or do you read back yeah. and say, hey, what what's here how do i keep this sharp well first i love the approach of your professor i mean that that sounds very similar to what my editor does so for me, like it, there's two, two levels of editing, like with the big publisher, I'll have my main editor who I work with and she's in charge of the big story things, like what you're talking about, like the big edits that and much less interesting after that is I go through multiple rounds of copy edits, which is just typos, syntax, fact checking. And actually I sort of enjoy going through that because I feel like, oh, these people, at one, I feel like I don't know how to put a sentence together apparently. And the other part is like, I, I feel very thankful that they make it better. Um, but while I'm writing, I would probably annoy your teacher though, because I'm someone I have to edit as I go. Like, I, I just can't, I wish I was someone who could spill it all out. Um, typically, you, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's a short story or novel, like on a good day, I'll get 500 words. And then the next day I will go back to the start of those 500 words. And usually I start slowly expanding this way. Um, and it, it'll almost feel like I'm not getting it forward, but like I slowly move forward that way. Um, and if it's a novel, I, no, no, I won't only go back to those first 500. I'll go back to the start of the chapter. So by the time like I finish a chapter, I've already sort of like picked through it a whole bunch of times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when I finish a full novel, I mean, it's certainly still a, a draft, but it's it's a lot more coherent than if it was if I just like sort of spilled it all out. And it's just, again, that's just the way that works for me. I don't know if that's a math brain thing or what, <laughs> um, but I don't know. It's just, it's just sort of what works for me. And, and plus he also writes in small spurts. You know what I mean? Um, so that, I think that makes sense. You're not the only writer. It's annoying to me because yeah. I'm like, clean up your crap after you're done writing. But I also know other prolific writers who do the same thing. 
So everybody has yeah. their own style, and and that most of them are former English teachers, but they'll edit as they write. And we, Maria, will agree that we'll tell our students, no, no, edit at the end, right? Once you've gotten your ideas out there, but everybody's process is different. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, so I I think you got to find what your rhythm is. So long. What I tell my students is, if that editor is so strong that it doesn't let you produce work, do it at the end. Tip the hat, say I see you, but come in at the end because then you won't produce, right? It is not necessarily a writer's block per se. Your editor is just very imposing and won't let you get into that creative flow. But because he's so like my brother here is so I call you my brother, right? My writing brother here is so practiced and he knows the style that he's able to do without interfering with the production of the five hundred words. So you kind of have to figure out what works for you, right? Like, do you have that really strong internal editor that's going to block you? Or are you able to use it as an instrument so you get to a refined piece? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I dig that, man. I'm not that person, though, Paul. I got to edit at the end. Yeah. I, I, I would say, it. like, uh, how, how we react to edits. <laughs> uh, obviously, that can be different from person to person. And, you know, sometimes you have no choice if you're in a class or a workshop and you're sharing your stories and you're getting feedback right in your face. That's a little bit different than you know, someone giving you comments, but I give myself, I have to a 24 hour rule when I get edits or, or criticism back. I, I cannot, I will not allow myself to work on it or respond to it for 24 hours. Cause I need that first day to be a whiny petulant baby <laughs> and be like, they don't get it. Why don't they get it? Doesn't. And then, doesn't. then usually after a day, you know, after I sleep on it kind of thing, I, I can be much more objective and be like, oh, I can see sort of like a compromise solution. Or, you, you know, if after a day I'm like, you know, what, I really don't think what they suggested is correct. I'm going to stick, you know, stick with what I have. Um, but I feel much, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing it from a much better state of mind if I let a little bit of time pass after the initial shock of like, oh my God, I thought this was perfect and it's not. <laughs> well, I told you too, your sentences are beautiful. Just oh, thank you. So either you or the editor both. I mean, you got a perfect marriage going, man. You know, yeah, I think. Thanks. All right. So Kirsten uh, Aquan, I know I put your name, has a question. What's your favorite non-horror work of fiction that you'd recommend to writers? Ooh, good one. Oh, wow. Um, hmm. I think I'd recommend writers' favorite work. Um, I mean, for me, like reading Kurt Vonnegut when I was in my mid twenties was sort of a little bit of a revelation to me. Cause I'd started off like so many horror writers. When I became a reader, I read Stephen King and found Peter Straub and Shirley Jackson through him. But then, you know, when I read Kurt Vonnegut, I felt like that was the first time I was like, not only, wow, I love this. I think it was the first time I thought, wow, I want to try something like that. Cause the voice, it, the voice just felt so like, like this is him sort of talking to us in this really cool sort of voice. Like I just wanted to try that. Um, but as far as like newer writers, uh, I really love uh, Sam Lipsight. Sam Lipsight. What's his most recent novel? Oh, no. I can't remember the title because it's kind of long. But uh, if I'm not reading horror, I like to read a lot of like humorous sort of literary fiction. Um, I kind of feel like it's, you know, you're, you're reacting to the same life absurdities. It's just <laughs> this way with humor as opposed to horror. Um, I, I will give you one more book, though. It's one that I've read already multiple times even though it's only been out for like five years, actually probably 10 years at this point. Uh, actually, I think she's a Chicago writer too. Sarah Levine, uh, Treasure Island, three exclamation points. Um, one of the funniest books I've ever read. And it's just so smart. Um, and it's, I'm sure like the English professors can tell me there's an official name for this kind of novel. Like, you know, some novels are called The Blinding's Roman. I'm probably saying it wrong. But uh, <laughs> one of my favorite kind of novels is I lovingly refer to it as the first person asshole narrator, uh, <laughs> w which means like it's the first person and this first, you know, and this narrator isn't very good at sort of <laughs> isn't good at being a person. They're, it's not that they're horrible people, but like they're just sort of a mess. And I love those kind of books. So Sarah Levine's Treasure Island, three exclamation points, um, features this unforgettable uh, woman who's just an absolute mess. Yeah. And it. And I think one of the fun parts is, you know, publishing for years and years of sort of allows and, and promotes male characters doing that. But it, at least until fairly recently, it's kind of rare to see, you know, a woman getting to tell a story like that. Um, yeah. So great question. Uh, great question, Kristen. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> she says, 
She, I do, I agree. She says she adores a first person asshole description. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. Uh, any? Okay, I have a question. I'll be selfish because you know I follow. Uh, I'm a stalker fan, I guess. I follow Paul on all the socials, but I often see pictures <laughs> of you, Joe Hill and De La Roca recently. Have you ever met Stephen King? I've never met him in person, but we've yes. exchanged a whole bunch of emails. Uh, yeah, I love yeah. the props you do in your books. I was going to see. I, I, no, I, I find that writers in general, the ones that aren't arrogant a-holes, are just amazing people. Um, who's one of your favorite writers? Doesn't have to be horror. Oh, I mean, who's? Um, well, I'm going to say one who is horror, who's working now. I think is you know all apologies to so many of my friends who are excellent writers, but. Um, Mariana Enriquez, I think, is my current favorite writer. Uh, she's she's just incredible. I've already like she had a she put out what was it last year a big giant eight hundred page epic novel that's sort of like Roberto Bolaño meets sort of cosmic horror, and it's just so well written. I've already read it twice. Uh, she has a new short story collection coming out later this summer. She's great. I've had a, you know I've been lucky enough to meet her as well. Uh, so she's well, a favorite. Is she the one that wrote Gothic. What's that? Is she the one that wrote Gothic? No, uh, I don't know. That I'm not. I'm not familiar with that one. I have to go back and check it. No, I was curious. Um, it's another. Uh, I, I need to catch up. Oh, and, and I would say Patrick Dewitt is another favorite writer. Again, he's someone who's more like on the literary humor side. Very right. dry, very funny. Also, Matt Johnson. Uh, he uh he has a book called Pim. That's a really fun riff uh on Poe's uh Gordon Pym story. Uh, that that's you know very satirical and it, you know it's about class and race and it's very funny. He he's a great writer too. Brilliant, brilliant. So Sherry Chavez wants to know. Uh, she's a huge fan of Stephen Graham Jones and his writing. But do you have a favorite '80s horror movie or recent horror movie that's your favorite? My favorite '80s horror movie is is The Thing. Uh, you know, and? it's probably not that exciting of an answer. <laughs> like, I wish I had like a a, <laughs> a deep cut for you. Um, more recent, and this movie's probably about 11, 12 years old now, is a movie called Lake Mungo. I'm sort of like unhealthily obsessed with that book. My, my book, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, could probably be correctly criticized as being Lake Mungo fan fiction on some level. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, uh, another recent favorite movie too is Lake, uh, Lake St. Maud. Oh, I'm not seeing that. Saint Maud. Yeah, hey, that's an A24 movie, sort of horror adjacent, but just an amazing movie. Oh, I gotta check that out. No, I gotta say the thing was also one of my favorites, just because you were left to wonder at that ending whether okay, I'm gonna spoil it for you, but that ending was brilliant, and I, I love that scene where Patrick Stacey drops his drink in the computer and calls it a bitch because a cheap <laughs> bitch. And I'm like, damn, that was profound, you know? Like, <laughs> think about it. They're in the middle of nowhere, and he just ruined the best piece of entertainment. Like, what's he gonna do with his time now? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, yeah. But it is just a beautiful movie if you haven't seen it. And and I think the original, they should have never messed with that original because the movies afterwards were absolute crap, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but no, that that's brilliant. I love that. I love that. Um, any other questions? We got we got like 20, 22 minutes left. And now I'm going to start asking. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I haven't read any of your books. So I would like to ask, one are you the most proud of? Ooh. Which one you say, well, you're going to start reading? Start reading this one. Exactly. <sighs> okay. So I'm going to give you two possibilities. <laughs> um, if, if that's not obnoxious. I mean, I think A Head Full of Ghosts definitely sort of is my favorite partly because it it helped save my career. Like I had published two, two novels in 2009, 2010 that were sort of quirky, darkly comedic first person asshole <laughs> uh, <laughs> private, de private detective novels uh, called the little sleep and no sleep to wonderland. You know, and I'm proud of those books, but my first go around with big publishers was really kind of a disaster. It didn't go well at all. Um, it's all their fault. <laughs> uh, I'm going to blame them, not my book. Um, but like, so after 2010, the publisher essentially dropped me and I spent the better part of three years, just really sort of like feeling sorry for myself and feeling bitter uh, and being jealous at other writers, you know, successes, which are all very natural emotions. But what you can't do is let those sort of take over your headspace because those are the page killers. Yeah. Um, so once I learned how to, 
I don't want to say ignore. Uh, once I learned how to sort of let go and just like acknowledge those feelings and then let them go away. Um, the the idea for a head full of ghosts literally fell into my lap. I think it was sort of just like a reward. Uh, my subconscious for, re rewarded me. So, you know, that book and then, you know, that book got Stephen King's notice. So for a lot of reasons, you know, I'm very proud of that book and it, it saved my career. Uh, but I do think, <laughs> again, I'm a terrible judge of what's scary or is not scary. But if you're not like a horror person, I think maybe that book is scary. I'm, I am also super proud of, I think if you're more like a literary reader, I think the Paul Barron's Club is more sort of your speed as like a found memoir. I mean, there's definitely some weird stuff, um, but I don't think it's as like as horror as some of the other stuff. Um, and that book, and that book is very much a thinly failed autobiography in some ways. Uh, but that's sort of part of the joke is like this is a found memoir of who this character is. Um, so I'm very proud of that one, even that one, even though that one probably has my lowest Goodreads rating. Uh, I take that as a badge of <laughs> of worth <laughs> in the opposite direction. But you know, Paul, I got to say that in in um, a head full of ghosts, one of the most terrifying scenes for me, and I'm not easily scared. Yo, I've been watching horror, living it, folklore, the tales my mom and my abuelita and my dad told me. Like I live, breathe, eat. Horror. But the scene where the older sister was talking to Mary in the bedroom, oh my gosh, that is haunting. <laughs> it is terrifying, legit terrifying. And and uh, maybe it's because I had an older sister with a total bruja, you know what I'm saying? Uh. But it, that is very, very, very um, I, I love that part. Go ahead, Maria. I, so going off of Priscilla's question, I so appreciate it. It made me think so. Um, my class, uh, we're reading contemporary American uh, literature and so we just suddenly added you to our our reading list oh, well, thank you. Overnight order growing things because we don't have time to read a whole novel sure sure so, good like, choice yeah. good choice so i ordered your your short, book of short stories it's arriving tomorrow and i'm going to scan some of them for my class so well, my question you. is um from that from that collection what are your suggested two or three short stories that we should read the best ones Oh boy, I should pull that out. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, that book. I mean, it would be probably too long because it's more like a novella. But that book does have the notes from the dog walker story in it. Just if you are interested to in see like oh, okay. how a well, how a story I'll was told through dog I'll notes. I can get you the. But I, too. yeah, I think uh, the two stories that I, I hear the most from teachers and people about uh, one is called "It's Against the Law to Feed the Ducks," okay. um, and that's a very quiet. I guess the first time I I used ambiguity in a way that like I ended up talking about it later, like without really knowing that I was sort of doing that. Um, and then there's another story uh, called 19 Snapshots of Dennis Port. And this story, yeah. yeah, this story is told through the description of 19 photos in a, yeah, 19 photos in a sort of like a, oh, like a keepsake book kind of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> another sort of weird narrative sort of technique kind of story but Perfect. thank you i appreciate that i hope hope to, uh, hope students enjoy the stories if they get a chance to read them they will where to find you you know and yeah. really great. he will respond to your not that you want to like <laughs> he's he's an amazing person and, and engages that's one of the things i love about paul but um thank you I, I i my students love survivor song they loved it and um just just really great great narration you know um hey i do have a question though paul because I, I know that. Um, oh, we didn't talk about the movie Head Full of Ghosts. I know you don't have a lot to do with, but right? <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk. Robert Downey Jr. looks like is he producing it or no? Well, he's part of the production team, and these same two production teams have been involved since like 2015. So, really briefly, like there, there's if your story or book gets optioned, that means they're renting usually 18 months exclusive access to to your story. And then at the end of the 18 months, they have to decide, are we going to renew it uh, or let the rights go back to you? And at some point, like if if it actually is becoming a movie, they, then they purchase the rights. So like an option fee is you know very small or a fraction of what it would be to actually buy the rights to the movie. So um, we're actually in a very strange place with a head full of ghosts because the option ran out like a week ago. Uh and yeah, so we're supposedly getting another offer from them, but like as of as of this point in time, I have no idea. It could be possible that we're starting over from scratch and we're trying to sell that book to somebody else next week. I don't know. 
Um, wow, I didn't know that's what happened. You literally sell the rights to your novel when it becomes a movie. Oh, the, uh, once typically what happens is you, uh, that sort of clause will kick in the day they start filming because anything can fall apart up until the day it starts filming. And that, that protects both the studio from having to send out a big check and it protects the writer too, because if they paid me all the money for buying the rights right now, that would be a great, that would be a lot. That'd be, you know, I wouldn't lie. It'd be good to have all that money, but if it falls apart, then no one else would ever be able to make the movie because they bought the rights. Um, and yeah. then, okay, I'm just being nosy because not. I mean, whatever else. But then after that, the sales in your books don't go to you anymore. Oh no, yeah. no. The, I, I mean, it should, they only buy film rights. That's all they get. They don't get. Okay, uh, okay, no. okay, okay. Yeah. Woo, so, was like, oh yeah, yeah. No. So when the cabinet the in the world. <laughs> no, that's I, amazing. Yeah, the sales for my book, the cabinet in the world, definitely got a bump from you know the movie, you know the subpar, the uh, the not <laughs> the sub superior movie. Sub superior is that a word? Yeah. Well, Hey, less I get you, less I, superior I, movie uh, definitely helps the sales of the book somewhat. I was talking about that with another student. I mean, I'm sorry, we nerd out quite a bit, and we talk yeah. about a lot of stuff. <laughs> but the, the we were talking about the ending of that of that movie compared to the novel. You know that we both agreed they completely M Night Shyamalan completely effed up the ending of that movie. Although we enjoyed the movie very much, we just watched it in my creative writing class. I know it sounds like a oh, nice. yeah. Man. And today we watch another horror movie to talk about mixed genres. We watched The Cabin in the Woods, which is classic. If you've not seen it, beautiful, beautiful. Recommend yeah. the screenplay, um, which is a terrible segue into my actual question <laughs> <laughs> about screenplays. Did did you already know how to write screenplays? Because I know you don't have not, not to throw dirt because it's nothing. Not yeah. a big deal. Y'all don't need an MFA to write. OK, you can write by practice, by reading, by studying. But did you have to? Um, teach yourself how to screen, how to write a screenplay, or did you take a class in it? No, I, I've taken zero writing classes, um, and and I I don't say that as like an anti intellectual stance. It's just that, sort that of yeah, it's just sort of like the realities that. of 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 like my you know teaching math and just writing. That's not to say I haven't had help. I've been very lucky that I've had mentors along the way. Nice. You know, almost like inexplicably, like someone like Stuart and Ann, who's like one of the best American novelists of you know the last forty years, like sort of like took me under his wing a little bit. So, you know, you, you still get help, you know, and I still do get help from tons of other writers like Stephen Graham Jones and I often will share manuscripts with each other and, you know, ask for, ask for edits and things like that. So, um, yeah. So as far as like the screenwriting stuff goes, I've barely dipped my toe in it and sort of the, the running gag in horror movie is that like right off the bat, like the person who wrote the screenplay and it's not a spoiler admits like, this is a very unorthodox screenplay and I did it this way on purpose. I mean, so it was a little bit of a way for me to, you know, to cheat with the form of the screenplay. Um, so I've, I've messed around with it a little bit. Um, but like, you know, I wouldn't be so arrogant to think that, you know, I could just like be really good at a screenplay right away. And it's like, <laughs> you know, I spent years writing short stories and I finally got like pretty decent at it. And then I just started over with novels. Like the first novels I tried writing were terrible. And you know, the first novel that I sold in 2007 and came out in 2009 was like the fourth and a half that I'd written. So, um, yeah. So, so, so screenplays, I'm just starting out. I'm just sort of figuring out what it's like. I, I imagine that it will hone, because your dialogue is beautiful. I know I keep saying one Thank of you. the people. Yeah, I'm going to read it for because what I'm getting at. It's beautiful. <laughs> but I, I do, and you can check it out at the public library. I actually have Paul Burr's Club in the Kindle. Um, but uh oh shoot, I lost me. This is what I get for gushing. I lost my train of thought. Oh hell, <laughs> it's gone, it's gone forever. But welcome, welcome. Kathy McKnight is also a member of the horrors forum that I was telling you about, who was saying how your work is so beautiful that she would read a math text. I would too. I would that's amazing. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that to you, but thank you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steal my class because we end at 320. You all welcome to stay. So I want to well, okay, before before we end, before we end, Kathy, feel free to ask questions. All right. Oh, I'm gonna add Kathy to the pool. Maybe. All right. So, so uh, let's do this mathematically. Um, somehow I just had this great idea. I'm gonna give away Kindle books and maybe hard copy, but after payday because I gotta get paid. <laughs> Usually I'm more prepared, but I forgot about spring break. All right. So pick a, a, a number. Be, uh, less than ten, Paul. Do I say it out loud or? Yeah, say it out loud. Okay. Uh, nine. Oh boy. One. Two, three, 
four. The, the method to my man is five, six, seven, eight, nine. Isaac, who left, wins the book. We're going to do it again. We're going to go faster. One, two. <laughs> I can pick another number if you want. Keep <laughs> okay, picking another number, a smaller number. Three. All right. One, two, three. Perfect. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Maria, you win a book. I put you in the pool. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, let's do this again. We're going to shuffle them, though, y'all. Like, cheater, cheater, fucking eater. <laughs> One, two, three. Roberto Salgado, winner. The question is this. Uh, what, what kind, Do you want a collection of short stories? Do you want me to wait until his book comes out? I will be here. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm teaching me to <laughs> Or, or paperback, what would you prefer? What's your preference? What's your preference? A collection of short stories? Collection of short stories? Yeah. Maria, you as well? I want his new book. His new book. Okay, for you, the new book. For the others, collection of short stories. <laughs> the Beast You Are. I vote The Beast You Are since you've already are studying the other stuff. Yeah. Normally, when <laughs> I have events, I I, uh, I do have books, but like I wasn't prepared today. Um, I apologize for that. It's just, you know, but I did bring snacks. We almost didn't have snacks. Ooh, snacks. That's good, good. Hey, listen, Paul, as ever, I mean, this this is just tremendous and amazing. You know, um, I know the students have to go. We have a, a few minutes, and we're going to stay yeah. on for, for the people that want to stay on. I know that McKnight may have some questions from you or for you, but I just want to thank you again, and uh, it's always a pleasure. I learned so much, so much wisdom about writing. So let's give Paul a huge round of applause. And we'll for a little bit longer. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. The audience, yeah. the live audience is beautiful. <laughs> and you remind me, it's Roberto Salgado, so I'll try and get these books as soon as, except for Maria's book. You want a hard copy, paperback, Miguel? Uh, okay. All right. So let's just maybe take a couple more questions. I'm, I'm really leaving it for Kathy. Kathy, if you want to ask a question. I can't even see you. Kathy's a huge fan. <laughs> so we'll just stay on for a little bit longer, and then we'll close out. Um, have an amazing day. You're welcome to stick around. You're welcome Thanks, to stick around. guys. Yeah, please take those snacks with you, or I'm going to eat them. Yeah, do you have a question, Kathy? Thank you, Ayo. No pressure, you're muted, sister. You got to mute, sister. Kathy, you're still muted. <laughs> Don't oh. you just mute them? Hey, there we go. Go ahead, sister. I'm so sorry. I'm not used to this. Uh, That's okay. Zoom thing. <laughs> I I work nights and I I I woke up so late. That's why I was so late. Um, oh no problem. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, I had questions yesterday and now I'm like so tired. So Paul Bearers Club's probably my favorite one. I know one question. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a mercy in my life. His name was Scott. Mm. Hopefully he maybe doesn't see this. But anyway, <laughs> I was wondering if she was maybe based on. A person that really influenced you in real life and brought you because I know you're a punk guy. Yeah. Um, no, I mean I kind of wish when I was in high school I sort of had a friend like Mercy, even though like obviously I don't know how good she was for well, for yeah. art. Um like the starting point for me was honestly like you know, art was like 85 percent me, and I thought Mercy was like 10 percent, <laughs> and the other five was all made up. I don't know if that math works out right, but uh, like, <laughs> especially in the in the margins, Mercy Mercy's voice is like the voice of my inner editor, the one that isn't like so supportive uh, <laughs> that, you, that you have to deal with, though. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I really got to read that book. Hey, I gotta oh, it's so you. good. You you uh emboldened me. I put out a hardback of my favorite um my, my bestseller, I guess. And I put a section in there of what inspired the the book. And a lot mm -hmm. of it was childhood trauma, my sister beating me up and all that. But one of the things I love about your books are the bits where you talk about where the inspiration comes from. You know, I love that. I think it's one of the well, thank best. You. And I wish people would just bring it back. You know, that, that it's, yeah. it's, kind of, you know, it's funny. My, yeah, my publisher sort of made me do it for a head full of ghosts. So I say maybe do it like they were like, hey, we want you to write something extra for the paperback. I was like, oh, OK. Uh, I thought for that book, it was fun to be like, hey, here are all the references. And then with each book, they were like, hey, can you do it again? <laughs> oh, although no, for Paul, I, I... Yeah. Although for Paul Bearers, they they ended up just putting it online as opposed to publishing it in the book. Because I don't think that book sold as well as the other one. So they were like, ah, we don't want to add more pages, more cost to the next book. But um, 
they I'm doing it again for or I did it again for horror movie because Barnes and Noble is going to be printing like a an exclusive Barnes and Noble edition for horror movie. Uh, and that'll include like the liner notes and another essay and stuff like that. Nice, nice. No, I love that. I also love it when writers put comprehension questions at the end too. You know, actually, <laughs> uh, that was the worst thing ever. Like for uh, really? handful of ghosts, was writing, <laughs> was writing the book club questions. That, that was so hard. I'm glad I've ne they've never asked me to do that again because I would have said no. <laughs> I, I enjoyed. It. I actually influenced another writer to do well, that. Well, thank you. I, yeah, I, I'm teaching this book in my class right now. It's a dystopian, it's a real book. And I insisted so much. He put comprehension questions in there, an interview. He put art in it. It's a damn beautiful book, though. And I'm like, yo, it's legit. Really, it's called yeah. Harsh Reality if you want to check it out. The cover is ugly. Sorry, huh. sorry for listening to this, brother. But the <laughs> inside of the book is beautiful. That you know? sounds cool. I like that, too, when, when writers do that. I love it. And it's not just because I'm a writer. It's because as a reader... You, I, it's next level for me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, any, any, one, any other parting questions for Paul? I know it's been. Go ahead. I have a question. Um, you're a math teacher, so yes, I I write fiction. I'm just starting seriously writing, and so you've been writing fiction for a long time, for 20 years. What is there a percentage that comes from your real life versus made up or? Does it fluctuate? The percentages go back and forth, go up and down? Yeah, I mean, I would say it fluctuates. Um, although, I think the best way to explain it is, again, crib for my friend Stephen Graham Jones. When I first met him, every book he would sign yeah. <laughs> would say, this one is pure autobiography. I'd be like, Stephen, this book is about a time-traveling camopede. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but now, I mean, now that I've <laughs> written... You know, Jesus, almost like 10 books now, I sort of get what Stephen meant by that. Um, clear, you know, more, some stories lean way more into the autobiographic, autobiography than others. Like, you know, uh, the Paul Bears Club leans in so hard, I was a little worried that I emptied the bucket and I would have nothing left <laughs> for other stories. But now, like, you, you, you know, you rest and you find out there's other things. Um, but for me, like, the fun part has been like each story is different. And I think, I think that's important to remind yourself, like it, there's a balance, even like for, you know, for new writers just starting out, like you, you've written a story, you want your next story to be different, but you also want to be like, Hey, I did this before I can do it again. So it's like a little bit of a balance of like, Oh, um, I can do this. And for me, it's just about being open to inspiration. Like um, I find that like, I'm always thinking about the thing I'm working on when I'm really like deep into it, even when I'm not writing, I feel like a lot of stuff happens that way. So I just make sure I keep like a notebook with me. Um, you know, so like if an idea sort of hits me, I write it down. Yeah, we talked about the magpie or last time, how you just get inspiration from a lot of different places. I carry a, right. like books, but now with technology, I have a Google Docs document yep. and lose the phone, you know, and I just got an idea every now and then. Um, yep. beautiful, beautiful. So, you know, I, I guess you kind of flirted with this question, never asked, what what drew you to writing? Because there's a stereotype of math people who don't write and, you know, <laughs> writers don't know math, which is BS. But... Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, it's kind of hard to explain. Uh, I, I would say, like, there were definitely, I had a want for a creative outlet. I, I think a, f a few things, like, you know, when I was growing up in high school, I wasn't very confident. And then I went to college and really sort of blossomed there and, like, I don't know. I sort of figured out it's okay to like things. It's okay to be passionate about things, right. you know, which sounds sort of like dumb, but like as a high schooler, like you make fun of each other because oh, he's trying hard in his homework or he's doing this. Uh, and on the internet, everyone shits on people if they like something, <laughs> but like as someone who's going to do art, like it's okay to like things. And for me, that was like an important thing to just to, to recognize. And if I liked the thing enough, I found myself wanting to try it, like knowing I would never be as good at it. Um, so like I, I before I started writing, I started learning how to play the guitar because I love music so much. It's like I have to try it. Like, um, and so for much of the late '90s, I was you know sort of a hobbyist musician and a hobbyist writer. But then I sort of figured out I was a better writer than musician, so I stuck with it. <laughs> um, but honestly, that was that's and even now it comes from that. Like when I read something that I love, it really inspires me to want to try to do something close to it, just so I can sort of sneak up to stand maybe like 10 feet behind it or something. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. And, and I think that's important to teach these days. You know, um, I also love the fact that you, you're a huge inspiration to me because we're both professors. Okay. We're busy. 
And to fight for that time to write is hard, especially when you have kids and, you know, and all that. I'm not that I'm saying you shouldn't have kids to be a writer, you know, both can happen. <laughs> Um, and, and be balanced, but I, I think that's amazing. It's beautiful. You're also one of, one of the writers that I respect a lot that does not have a master's of fine arts. Gabino doesn't have a master's in fine arts either. Oh, Cynthia, I didn't know that. Yeah, he does not. It, but the funny thing, he teaches in an MFA program. He's teaching, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gabino Iglesias <laughs> was a second Puerto Rican born writer to win the Bram Stoker last year. Cynthia Pelaya was the first for a collection of poetry called Crime Scene, which I actually have to go pick up at the bookstore. But uh, I, I I love that. I love the fact that there are prolific writers who who studied and did the hard work, you know. And uh, like I I'm, I'm shocked that you've never taken a writing class. But I'm not surprised. You've done the hard work. I love it. I love that. You know. Uh, well, listen, Paul. This is as ever. It's been so amazing. Um, I just am so happy that you spend time with us and and give us so much wisdom about the writing process. Just cannot wait to read horror movie. I'm like waiting for paid in a pre-order, man. Like it's just gonna click <laughs> away, you know. But I recommend all of his work. Um, well, thank you. Uh, hope he turns out and wish you all the best in this Chat GP lawsuit. Constantly praying for you and for the victory of all these other writers, man. <laughs> you know, but uh, so so grateful. And no, it's just a couple of us. Hey, let's give it up for Paul. That was beautiful. You. No, oh, thank you so much. Thank I really appreciate much. it. No, this thank was a lot of fun. I appreciate brother. it. Hey, I'm going to be teaching this this summer remotely, but hopefully we'll be in the city and maybe we'll be able to wine and dine you and show you the best places to eat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or at least yeah. recommend. All right, my friend. Have a blessed day. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Have a Thank blessed you. Day. Nice Bye. meeting everybody.